Well, good morning, everyone. We'll uh, commence the hearing number 29, designations for the Selwyn District Plan uh, review process. So just before I hear from our first submitters, uh, 4218, anything for us this morning? Great, thanks very much. Well, um, Mr. and Mrs. Nesbitt, uh, you don't have to wear a mask when you're speaking unless you really want to. If you're more comfortable wearing a mask, that's absolutely fine. You, that's good. So thanks very much for making the uh, original submission, which you've read, so you don't need to reread that out to us. But you're very welcome to highlight your key points for us, and you have provided a, a document, so happy for you to lead us through that. Um, stress the points you want us to take in mind, and then we'll see if we have any questions for you. You just there's a button on the left hand the right hand side of that black box in front of you if you could push the right hand button yeah good oh. um, so the first page of the table of contents is a copy of the proposed plan which um, the planning department of the Sylvan district council gave us in i think november 2020 which was really the basis of our submissions. Um, the second page <clears throat> uh, shows or tries to show you the uh, position of the proposed tennis courts in relationship to our house and its surrounds. And the third page is photographs of the current floodlights which um, are on our border with the reserve and it shows the amount of uh, light spill that comes onto our property from those floodlights. And also the picture of the light spill onto that tree is probably 100 metres away, closer to our house. So. Uh, it just tries to show you what impact they have on our environment. All right, um, so I'll just, I've got a speech written out here, so I'll read that to you. Firstly, I'd like to thank the Sylvan District Council for giving us the opportunity to address our concerns regarding designation SDC 196. We live at the property adjacent to the proposed site in a general rural zone. I'd like to begin by saying that I support the development of a community recreation facilities and infrastructure, such as the new tennis courts on West Melton. I myself played tennis for many years, and if I stay in West Melton, I'd like to for I look forward to seeing my granddaughters enjoying playing on these courts. We recognize that the district is growing and must change as a result, but at the same time, we want to protect what is valuable. It is important <clears throat> that the new facilities and infrastructure do not unreasonably impact the rural character of West Milton. Whether we remain in West Milton or not, as neighbors of the new development, the burden of protecting the rural character falls on us. The conditions need to ensure that the potential impacts of the recreation activities such as noise, light, and reduced security do not adversely impact on the rural character and use of the surrounding property. Um, <clears throat> rural character. We live in a general rural zone in the plains. Within the SDC website, there is a section called Rural Residential Landscape Values. Within this section, it reads, maintain rural views to assist in achieving a necessary degree of ruralness and openness. I also read within the SDC website that there should not be examples of development that could lead to undermining the, of the character and amenity values. Further examples within the SDC website pertaining to rural areas are that there should not be obtrusive light spill and glare, adverse effect on, in the visibility of the night sky. 
also within the SDC website is a section called the top 10 reasons for choosing a lifestyle block. These are also the reasons why we chose to buy a lifestyle block. They include rural and country living, peace and quiet tranquility, space, privacy, openness, no close neighbors, less pressure, relaxing. The last use of the land which the proposed tennis courts are to be built was a sheep paddock. Lighting. This brings me to the current floodlights over the reserve and bordering our property. Firstly, they were built while we own the property without any consultation. Secondly, they are an eyesore. Thirdly, I am sure they would not comply to any light spill standards. I refer to the photos and the amount of light spill onto our property. In the SDC's Notice to Territorial Authorities Requirement for Designation or Alteration of Designation pertaining to the West Milton Domain, it reads, at West Milton Domain, the sports fields and courts have flood lighting. The effects from the lighting have been present for some time and are an existing part of the environment. Because they've been present for some time doesn't make a right. They do not fit any standard. This is why we are very conscious of the proposed lighting on the proposed tennis courts, which under the current plans would be very much closer to our residents. We do not want to see any further light spill onto our property. The condition should have a requirement to minimize the fullest extent possible the impact of lighting on neighboring properties, such as by positioning any infrastructure using lighting as far as possible from the border. It follows that the pole height of any floodlights should not be seen from our property and additional steps should be taken to minimize the light operating hours, such as condition requiring motion sensors. Noise. The conditions do not impose any constraints on the amount of noise associated with recreational activities, not even at night. Noise is a major concern for us. As I mentioned in my day, I played representative provincial tennis. I know how much noise comes from tennis courts, from the noise of the racket hitting the ball and the players having a good time. This is why we would like the courts to be far away from our property as possible. This really will impact on our environment. We think the tennis courts will create excessive noise on our property, which the RMA defines as any noise that is under human control and of such a nature as to unreasonably interfere with peace, comfort and convenience of any person. The conditions should require an acoustically efficient fence to be constructed between the reserve and adjoining properties to mitigate adverse noise effects on neighboring landowners. The conditions also should also define what recreational activities will be permitted in the new domain. This is to prevent uses in the future that produce far in excess of acceptable noise levels. Next subject, security. Security to neighbours is not mentioned on SDC 196 conditions. Since the skating park was built, we have noticed, really, we have noticed naturally more kids around. We have had instances where groups have built huts in the hedge line between us and the reserve, taking timber from our property. We have also had a situation where a group of people came onto our property, tried to get into my truck which I reported to the police. The condition should address security considerations for adjoining properties and require measures such as adequate security fencing to be constructed. We don't want people or groups entering our property from the domain to retrieve tennis balls or for any other reason. Uh, next subject is mandatory consultation on the design, on the detailed design. The 42A report on SDC 196 designation considers 
that the issues we identified in our written submission should be addressed at some later design state phase, not at this point in the process. After receiving the general conditions of designation SDC 196, we had a meeting with the planning department of the SDC on the 27th of November, 2020, to understand whether there was going to be any adverse effects on our environment. It was at this meeting that the council showed us the detailed outline plans of where the tennis courts were to be positioned within the reserve. The planning department also indicated at that meeting that the proposed floodlights were likely to be positioned on the two most easterly courts away from our boundary. In the most recent communication, the council indicated that the floodlights were to be positioned on the corner of all the courts. We would not be in favour of this. While we understand that the detailed outline plans are not final, they did help us understand the areas where SDC 196 conditions are insufficient to manage the impact of the proposed reserve on our property. We submit that the conditions should require mandatory consultation with adjoining landowners on the proposed detailed design of the site. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can, can you make available a copy of those written comments for us? I've got um, four copies here. Great. Right. Yep. Thank you. And just um, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So looking at this um, aerial photograph here, that one. Yeah. So your property is, which is your property? Can I come up and show you? Or? Yeah, of course. Come on up. Yeah, I just want to confirm which one it is. That one. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. So just for the rest of the panel, so it's this property here. Yeah. And Deborah. That one. Yeah. Right. That's what I thought. Just wanted to make sure we got that right. All right, I'll just see if we have any um, questions for you. You can give the, the written copies of your verbal statement. You can just give them to Grace, uh, Admin Secretary here, um, afterwards if you like, and she'll provide them to us. I'll put it on this one. Great, thanks very much. Right, I'll see if we have any uh, questions for you. Lindsay, any questions? Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, in terms of the photographs yeah. which you're showing, now they, they are existing light poles yeah. on the site. We, we are in relation to your property, are these existing light poles? They're not, because the tennis court is in there, presumably. Do, Sorry? Are, are they, what, what, are the, what are they lighting at the moment? Are they the tennis courts? I didn't think. No, they're, they're, rugby they're, they're over the rugby fields. Okay. Which is down the end of the property. And those photographs I've taken of those lights are really from our position of our house. Okay. So, again, um, in, re in relation to your property here, yes. where are those lights which you've taken photographs of? In, in this area in here? Sorry. Okay. Well, I, I have to, do you want me to come up and show you? Um, it, it might well, be. It's hard to describe. Yeah, right. it's coming up. Yeah, yeah. If you, you can, so I get a general indication of yeah. of what's there at the moment and what's proposed. But there's no lights adjoining here at the moment, yeah. but there is proposed to be. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so on, on this plan, there's existing lighting down this boundary here. Yep. yep. Okay, and the tree which is referred to in the photographs is this tree here. Oh, yeah. And, and, the, and the proposal was to, is to implement quite an extensive yep. master plan 
um, which is shown on that previous boundary. Yep. Um, I'm, uh, are, you, are you familiar with the, the designation process itself? The, no. Okay, so a, a designation is um, it's available for councils and for ministers of the crown, for example, to designate for a public work, and an open space can be deemed to be a public work. Okay, so once that designation is in place, then there is a further process of an outline plan, which need to be, which may or may not need to be submitted, which um, will indicate the detail. So we're at that first stage of whether the designation for recreation reserve is, is, is uh, appropriate. And then there is another stage later when the detail comes in, and, and it, generally it's a two-way process between the applicant and the council, and in which case here the applicant is both the council but with the, if you like, the Chinese wall in between the reserves department and the planning department. Um, so the, 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 the designation is, is in place and, and, a, and, a, and a requiring or a designating authority can do anything which is in accordance with the designation, which is in this case is recreation. So I just wondered whether you would you're familiar with the nuances. It's 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 different from a resource consent process because it's for a public public work. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, not yeah, sorry, I might have flummoxed you with with plan, planning speak. Yeah. Um, so um, we we're at that stage about whether or not that designation is appropriate for for, res, for recreation purposes mm. at this stage. With another stage happening. And um, it's, it sounds like you've been in some communication with the reserves part of council yes. in terms of implementation of that. Do you know in terms of timing what, what their expectations are? Um, and whether there is a process in place for you to Well, this is why we made discussion? our submissions now, because we didn't know what opportunities we were going to have later. Yeah. And uh, But as far as what their plans are, I'm not 100%, I think 23. 2023, 24, I'm not sure. Okay. And some of some of those conditions just anticipating what they might be on, on the outline plan could be in relation to light spill, um, which you know, I know that you, you're concerned about noise and having to pick up tennis balls and so forth, which might fly over the fence. But um, a, a lot, lot I gather that a lot of your concerns are in relation to lot, relating to light spill. Well, and the other ones in which we mentioned as well, and equally. The other, and the other ones. Yeah. Because normally with uh, flood lighting proposals, there there is conditions relating to minimising that light spill to make sure that the light is actually focused downward on the yeah. area which well, needs to be Well, you can see from those photos, that they're, they're not, are they? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I don't have a, a, a lot more um, questions other than to say that it sounds like there is a process with council still to be gone through yes. in terms of raising your concerns um, uh, and, um, and um, presumably the council will take that up. Uh, thank you. Okay. Yvette? Kia ora, thank you for your submission and I have no further questions. Thank you. Deborah? Yeah. One question. Um, with regards to the Chinese flag, um, do you know how long that actually has been used for? I know the older Chinese flag, the one um, which is related to the Chinese flag. I can only guess as far as it's been, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. Like, what kind of years? Um, but that's a guess. Probably not. So. Well, maybe my wife thinks maybe they've been there less. Council, council, council. Sure, yeah, the council will be able to tell you. Yeah, but that's something we can get the um, council staff to um, clarify for us. They would have that at their fingertips with a bit of research, I imagine. So if we can have that in the reply report, please. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So obviously, um, well not obviously, so the notified designation had a number of conditions attached to it. So you've had a look at those conditions, have you? Yes. And so it's your concern that the, um, the numerous conditions already in the designation relating to clear, you're not satisfied they're sufficient. That'd be right. Have you taken any, any advice on that? No. Or is that just your own personal views? Personal view. Okay. And is your main concern with the noise, the noise conditions on the designations, they, they exclude outdoor recreation, which I think is the point you made. Is that your main concern, that that doesn't appear to be covered by those noise limits? Yeah, there's no restraint on noise at all. Well, there is. There's noise limits imposed on the designations uh, that relate to activities other than outdoor recreation. Other than, other than. Yeah, yeah, other yeah, than. Other than, well, it's only outdoor recreation that's going to yeah, take yeah. place, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So just, I guess what I'm asking, if that's your main concern about the noise. When you say condition. main concern, there are, there's not just one main concern. You're talking about noise. Yeah. Oh, about noise, yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yeah, I understand there's a number of concerns you outlined to us, yeah. clear, noise, security, yeah. Yeah. et cetera. But just in terms of noise, it's, it's the outdoor recreation not appearing to be covered by those limits. Yes, that's okay. right. Good, good. All right, well, thanks very much for coming in and presenting your material to us. I yeah. think you've outlined your concerns very clearly, so we're... Right. I'm pretty sure that we're aware of what, what your concerns are. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. So the next submitter, I think we're scheduled here, Terry and Barbara Hyler. So Mr. Hyler, thank you. Uh, still morning. Good morning and welcome. You've supplied some speaking notes for us, uh, which we thank you for. We've read those, so you don't need to read those out loud to us. Um, but you're very welcome to, if you want to, outline your key concerns, uh, summarise your key points, and then we'll see if we have questions for you. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. I uh, submitted before the noise hearing. Uh, the reason that we're here, I'm here, is because during that hearing, we raised the issue of designation in respect of the rifle range as part of the discussion about the noise aspects. So this is, uh, we were not submitters to the designation chapter per se. Um, I've studied the Section 42A report on designations prepared by the council staff. Um, and I note that the council had commissioned uh, a legal opinion as to whether or not provisions of the RMA could be applied to the activities of those uh, that occupied designated areas uh, under that piece of legislation. Uh, and the answer being that that, that was an appropriate uh, possibility um, in regard to the rest of the rifle range. So thank we, I think we thank the council for moving forward to clarify that issue, which was unclear at the time. But we move on to the recommendations in section nine of the section 42A report, uh, particularly paragraphs 19, 16 and thereafter, where the planner or the author has suggested that what might happen after that legal opinion was received would be that uh, a noise management plan of a type could be applied to the activities of the defence force uh, on the West Mountain Rifle Range uh, occupation, but that aspects of confidentiality uh, were important to the defence force and that any such plan would have to be high level and generic. Uh, there's no explanation given in the Section 42A report as to what that means. Um, so I suggest that's a pretty useless uh, piece of English language. An additional recommendation is the six monthly meetings with the community, not defined, 
uh, could be a mechanism to ensure that the activities of the NZDF under the noise management plan would satisfy RMA requirements. Uh, RMA requirements in this regard not defined, uh, relationship between the so-called community at every six months not defined. So I would suggest to you that this is clearly open to debate as to whether it's likely to be effective in satisfying the concerns of the community uh, about the matter that we're talking about. There's really one important point that I want to make to this hearing, and that is this. I believe that the community do not care whether or not the army lets off bombs, drives tanks, lands helicopters, digs holes, washes dishes, or yells out. We're not interested in what the army does. We're only interested in the noise that the activities generate and whether they are reasonable. And there has been a confusion in a lot of discussions to date as to controlling how many types of tanks or how many claymore bombs can be let off. That's not the point. This is no different from an airport designation where the flights are controlled to a noise level and to a timing and duration. I think we should look at this freshly and say that it's a very simple problem. The same issue has come up when NZ, when the Army has, has looked to get resource consents for their field training activities, where they go out and play war games on the local paddock and they've got to get approval from the local district council as to what they do. Under those conditions, the Army says how many Land Rovers, how many tanks, how many guns, right? But that's not what is relevant here in a designated area. All that is relevant is that the Army does what it has to do to look after the security of the country, but it does it in a way that's acceptable under the terms of the RMA and its responsibilities. I would, there, would suggest to you that uh, some thought be given and to the council itself that The noise parameters that are acceptable to the community and to the Defence Force and to the Council be developed, regardless of what causes that noise. That would, I guess, consist of a combination of when, how loud, for how long, all the other ways in which noise is controlled with other activities. Very simple. We don't care what the army does with its secret weapons. It's just how much noise it makes. Having had a debate about that at an agreement, as in many other RMA situations, it would be the responsibility of the polluter to monitor. The army then would be responsible to monitor its compliance with the agreed plan and to report back to council. Council, its wisdom, would then establish some form of community consultation to keep the community informed that things were moving along in accordance with what has been agreed. So that all of the earlier discussions that have gone on here and the time that's been wasted in regard to uh, uh, zoning changes within the decibel ranges, uh, the, the relevance of the decibel ranges themselves are questionable. They were only defined to define where the covenants went onto the titles and what the building restrictions would be. But if one looks at the administration of the RMA, it is quite simple. Polluter pays, polluter is responsible for it. The army creates the noise, agree on what's acceptable to the noise with the experts, let the army monitor it, as do the water users in this country monitor all their water use under the RMA, uh, and, and have uh, that monitoring reported back to council. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll see if we have uh, questions for you, Lindsay. Um, thank you for your submission. Um, how long have you lived near the range? 1974. Okay. And um, have you had any reason to complain to the Army about the levels of activity? So we've been told um, that 
certainly by the um, NZTF evidence that there's been very few complaints. About. I agree with that. Okay. So I'm really just trying to establish what, what you want in terms of a condition on designation. Designation relates to the activities for um, the firing range and the various different other things which have occurred for some considerable time. And the proposal for from the officer is to have a, a, a noise management plan at a fairly high level, which sets in a process, as opposed to setting limits on how much noise can be can be there. The the process is an interesting one, sir. Um, standing orders are the missing document in the story. Of course, we've never ever been able to see what they are, because they belong to the army, and legally not. Uh, available to anybody else. We are fearful of giving the Defence Force an open check to do exactly what they want without any recourse for the community to come back and say that's unacceptable. What is wrong with defining what those limits should be according to all the rules that are there to do it? You've mm. mentioned them before, right? Um, and, and have have a plan agreed. Yes. Yeah, so so you're ideally wanting to have some limits about how much noise calculated over a certain period between the hours of six and eight, to... nine and ten, whatever is appropriate is discussed, right? Yeah. And get an agreement on that that suits everybody, and then put the responsibility on the army to make sure that they measure up to what they've agreed to. So have you had the opportunity to have a look at the evidence produced by? Defence Force? Yes. Okay. So that, that, that evidence says, well, we really don't want to want to have a condition for restricting noise using what they call the best practical option for minimising noise. But if we had to have a condition, this is what a noise management plan would look like. And that's in the evidence of the planner. If, the, um, if there are conditions, and one could imagine there could well be in situations of national emergency, where there need to be a departure from a status quo agreed plan, mm. there's got to be provisions made for that because that's a different story, right? Yeah. But in the meantime, why should the Army be able to walk away from its responsibility <coughs> with, 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 with statements about confidentiality and high level and nominal, mm. none of which are defined, the community not defined, at six monthly intervals, one can see where that's going to go. It's going to go to bed. So is, is it a, a, a lack of a process to be able to talk to the, the army about what they're doing and whether they're unreasonable or is it, or is it just the annoyance levels? I've, unfortunately, I wasn't on the noise hearing, uh, other, other, but, but the chair was. Mm. Um, so there is a crossover. Between. There has been there has been some instances with some people have been uh, felt they've been affected by by the noise levels. What prompted it was the initial NZ Def Defence Force wanting to put covenants, no complaint covenants on all the titles, right? And that straight away awakened mm. the democratic feelings of the community. Who are, who are they to muzzle us? and give them carte blanche to do whatever they want to do, right? And then it's moved on through a series of disasters till we've got to this particular point. And I would ask you the question, what is wrong with what I'm proposing, right? What is wrong with agreeing to a management plan that's got some flexibility about it, that recognises the, the security issues and whatnot, and a proper monitoring situation, the responsibility of the polluter, and a proper role for council? Very simple and very similar to what goes on in many other RMA issues such as this. So you're supportive of a noise management plan condition, but are you wanting to have some sort of limits included in that in terms of the way that they calculate noise from an intermittent source? <clears throat> you're wanting to have some, some sort of limits, or is, there, is it really it, just a... Their, their standing orders basically reflect that, that issue because they don't do things at midnight. Right. 
So they're reasonable about that. Mm. Why can't we why can't we articulate and write down what these standing orders are and see whether they are suitable or not? Yeah. But we can't see them. Okay. So the the, re, the recommendation and and probably the most, if you like, the further restore in terms of the thinking is the evidence, I think, from this Bavistock. Actually, if there was to be a noise management plan, these are the sorts of things it would contain. So is that not sufficient to allow you? No, I think that's a good rules? place to start. Okay. Absolutely. All yeah. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> there any questions? No, no, thank you. Thank you for your submission. Um, my question was, what would you like to see differently? Um, and I think it's well covered by my there. colleague. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, Deborah. Um, no. No. That was a proposal early in the piece from the Defence Force to manage this issue. Just by way of clarification, that was covered in the noise hearing. That's the relief that NZDF are seeking. The imposition of a no complaints cover provisions within the district plan. So that's a matter that that panel will be considering. Okay. Thank you. And no further questions from me either. Thank you very much. But as you were, we did traverse these issues and, and the noise hearing too, which I was at. Thank so, you for your time. No, thank you. Alistair and Jenny Nicole. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, uh, my name is Alistair Nicole, and I'm re representing my wife Jenny and uh, Sally Gardner, who's had a similar submission. Uh, we've lived in the West Milton area since 1974 when we built a house in Bells Road and we moved to our current property in uh, 30 years ago, which is a direct neighbour of the Defence Force. So we're well aware of their activities and uh, in most cases uh, we've had pretty good neighbourly relations. Uh, in our submission, our original submission, uh, we suggested that a uh, uh, condition, a noise management plan could be part of the condition of the army designation. And that was to formalize, a way of formalizing what developed as a sort of gentleman's agreement between the army and the council after a bad experience in 2009, where there were noise, where there were significant noise complaints. And that has worked quite well, I think, since then. Uh, but there's, it's, there's no formal, uh, it wasn't formally established. And we suggested that the, a noise management plan would be a way of formalizing that because the standing orders, et cetera, we don't, we don't get a chance to see. So that was the basis of our, uh, our suggestion for a noise management plan. Uh, we've been heartened by the officer's report, which uh, shows that A, there's no legal impediment to uh, adding a condition to the designation. Secondly, that the Selwyn District Council officers seem to be supportive of the concept of a noise management plan being appropriate. And also the Defence Force uh, saying that if they would accept one, if it meant there was likely to be less reverse, uh, uh, reverse uh, uh, sensitivity for them by having it in there. So that's all positive. However, we're very disappointed in Appendix 2 of the report, which is ridiculously vague about how this all might happen and what it might con 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 what the noise man man management plan might be. And we've made a list in our original uh, in submission and in my current notes to you of what the, the items that might be in there and the level of noise that uh, might be expected from that. Uh, so we, 
I, I, we think it's most important uh, if this goes ahead, as we as it looks like it sh should, that the council, the army, and the council take the residents along with them in developing the noise management plan, so that that, that it protects the interests of the army, it protects the interests of the residents uh, in in a in a in an acceptable way. And there's no detail as to how that might happen, uh, and no. No, no suggestion that the resident should be involved in the, in in that process, uh, and, and nothing about how it's go, how it, the detail of how it's going to be monitored, etc. So it's very vague, and from that point of view, is very is very disappointing. I just like to make the point that uh, the adoption of a noise management plan. Uh, in the, in the, as a condition, I think is likely to have implications to other components of the of the proposed district plan for example the proposed activity status of the 55 and 65 uh, decibel uh, decibel overlays thank you thank you very much Let's see if we have questions for you um Lindsay. um no no I, I don't have any specific questions but perhaps you can comment uh, have you had ever the, the reason to be able to complain about the the, the activities that the you have yes and and how was that dealt with from the, the uh, well the, the 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 major one was uh in the, the, the 2000 and 2009 mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, a lot of people complained about a lot of pe people complained about that and we did shook it shook houses and brought ceilings down and it was a major mistake that the army made so that 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 was a major one um, more recently, uh, there's been activity uh, on the stock bank. Uh, I don't think this has been uh, formally complaint. Uh, no, hasn't been a formal mm. complaint to the to the army over this. But the stock, the ECAN stock bank is a very convenient. Has become a very convenient uh, uh, traffic way from. It's only 50 meters from our boundary, and before that, all the activity was was behind was mm -hmm. behind that further into the range uh, and that's uh, and, and it's easily that's easily fixable they just need to be told not to not, not to use their vehicles or their uh, or the soldiers on the stock bank uh, so that that's just an illustration and probably more helicopters there's been more helicopter noise than there used to be uh, as well so what what you'd like us to do is to uh, recommend a condition back to New Zealand Defence Force that there be a noise management plan which, if you like, codifies the best practice management of noise. Yeah. Okay. And, and, it's mon and it's monitoring. And it's monitoring. And, and would, would you expect there be some sort of limits on it, like hours of operation or total, uh, uh, yeah, total, yeah, yeah, total I mean, average I, noise? I think I've listed uh, the, yes. a lot of the conditions that they've that, that, were originally in that 2009 agreement, uh, and obviously the the decibel levels that they've set now are, 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 are setting a limit to the noise that are expected in those zones. Mm, okay. All right. Thank you. No, thank you, and thank you for your submission. Thank you, Deborah. Um, thank you for your submission. Um, with regards to the list um, that you've currently put in your submission that you would like a noise management plan, um, you just mentioned that all of those conditions are currently being um, complied with, but it's not formalised. It's not, uh, as I understand it, it's not formalised. That, yeah. That, uh, in fact, most of those uh, conditions I've lifted, I've lifted out of uh, one of the army, one of the defence force submit, submissions. Okay. Uh, you know, these are the things that they think about, and and uh, that that's perfect. The list is good, apart from perhaps the noise, the noise limits. It's just that there's no formal way uh, that 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 we can we can refer to that. It's always been an internal document or 
some, as, as I said, this gentleman's agreement that they seem to have with the council, uh, which they, which they, and that was in response to the bad experience in 2009. And that sort of tidied things up a lot. We're just looking at a way to formalize that uh, through an, a formal noise management plan. And does the New Zealand Defence Force today currently um, publicly notify when they are having? Yes. They do. Um, uh, they do through the through the press through the paper, and uh, if you're if you're on and they'll email you if you're on the email list you get an email uh, telling you exactly what they're well not exactly what they're going to do but a broad brush obviously they can't say exactly what they're going to do but a broad brush about when when they'll be operating what days they'll be in the range what they'll be doing whether they'll be live firing or uh, so yeah there's a bit of detail there. Um, and that process, um, if I've picked up, is working well currently. Uh, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's well enough promulgated. There's a lot of people that you would think would be on the email list that aren't. So I think there's a lot of people that don't know they could be more individually uh, advised, rather than expecting to read it in the paper, which obviously look, not many people get the paper these days. So uh, you need to be you need to be some a social media way of of advising people as well. I don't think that's quite as good as it as it could be, but they they try. And is that the reason why you would like to be um, have an input into the noise management plan, just to just to fill in the gaps or cover these particular issues? Yeah, I I, I think it would, it would be give give the residents confidence in the noise management plan if they were involved. In, in 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 devising it otherwise it's just left up to the army and the council uh, and who's who's going to uh, win in that argument i think that having a having a representative of the residents there would uh, give you a three party development of the of the noise management plan okay thank you and no further questions from me thank you So we're good, we're finished now. Um, so Mr. Halliday. Mr. Halliday, you've appeared before, um, certainly me before in the noise hearing, so I think you know the drill. So. Um, I uh, don't need to read out anything that you've pre-circulated, uh, but you're very welcome to highlight key points for us. So, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thanks, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak here. Um, just be interested if I can get up the slide that actually shows the, the actual, I think it's my slide number two or three. Next one, please. It's one that's got the map on it. Go down to the, the noise map. That's the one. Thanks very much. So this was the um, this is the actual noise map that uh, was put out in the Tonkin Taylor review, assessing the noise from the West Melton Rifle Range, um, and what. That was really the um, report that sparked my interest there because it was actually a reassessment of the modeling, right? Of the noise modeling, ostensibly for a rifle range that's producing the same amount of noise. The Army's always said that they're not increasing the amount of noise significantly coming from the rifle range. So what I'll put on that map there is the, the actual basis of the map is the updated noise contours, right? So the outer yellow line you can see there, which re reaches, um, if you know the area, reaches nearly to Halkett Road. Um, and the red line on that same map is the 65 decibel line, which reaches about halfway down Melton Grange Road. So that was the updated modelling. Um, the previous modelling uh, done by MHA Associates 
has the 55 decibel line there, the regularly yellow line that I've written in there with my artistic endeavours, 55, that's the original position for the 55 decibel line. So the 55 decibel line with the new modelling um, for ostensibly the same noise emissions is moved out uh, by a factor of, if you, if you look at a radius, a factor of more than two times the radius out for the same amount of noise. So that was what uh, sparked my interest in um, investigating this, this a little bit closer. Because, um, yeah, a huge increase in coverage for us tends to be the same amount of noise. It was just uh, an observation. So what we're finding then is that 65 decibel red line includes people who are ostensibly 20% 20, 20 of them are going to be highly annoyed by the noise level produced by the rifle range. This is, this is what comes out of the approach that's being used, right? So that's roughly, uh, roughly 15 people who'd be highly annoyed. So, okay, that's just, just a, a point there. And additionally, what I, what I found was I, I thought, well, okay, um, the approach is that you know, we're following a, along the lines of what's done in the US and the, and the UK. So they do have um, noise management plans as part of their re regime, if you like, operating systems for, for managing the noise from rifle ranges. What I found was that uh, there's actually a proposition uh, from the US research that says, okay, for the, for the Schultz curve, where 20% of people are annoyed by a certain amount of noise, that this noise is for like standard noise, like road traffic noise. If you ask somebody for the same noise level, if, if it's actually rifle range noise, they're actually more annoyed by it. And you can probably just subjectively assess that for yourself. For a given volume of noise, you're gonna be more annoyed by a car going past or by the noise of a local rifle range. So what, what they found was that people are more annoyed by the sound of impulse noise than they are by a car going past. So that actually hasn't been allowed for in the modelling. So people are actually going to be more annoyed than what the modelling suggests. So what I've suggested in my presentation, I only just found this out, is that perhaps um, you know, cult consultants should have a, a, a look at that and actually you know, there might be some re reassessment required then of what, what we believe the effects are on people, particularly inside the 65 decibel line. But unfortunately here, I'm, I'm an engineer, so I tend to get caught up in the detail and lose, lose sight of the big picture, right? Big picture is that what we're here is to actually, I'm supporting Alistair Nickel in the proposal that a noise management plan is a good idea for this. And so, Noise man management plans are actually used in the UK and in the USA in their military um, plans for operating rifle ranges, as uh, outlined in my presentation there. I won't go through that, just to actually use that, that that's a support for the need for a, no a noise management plan. And there's also been discussion about the range standing orders, and I was confused by that myself because of being in the neighbourhood, I heard that these RSOs, they call them, existed. And these were like the, the rules, if you like, that everybody agreed were uh, applying and the army were, were like using these. But when I actually tried to find them, of course, they're impossible to find because they really don't exist. They're a private uh, list of orders which exist only for the army. So that's, that, that, and that's the normal thing. That's what RSOs are, right? They're, they're for the army, they're not for us. So, but uh, what I did find was that um, in 2011, there was a, a letter uh, published in the Christchurch Press by the then commander of the, of the local um, army division in, in the South Island. And to me, that was, um, I, I thought that was quite encouraging because I, if, you, if you read that, it's got a lot of um, sort of positive statements about, uh, about what the army's actually, what their point of view is on the environment and on noise. So, you know, a couple of statements out of there, you know, it's, it says here, we've learned a lot about our environment over the years. 
We know that weather patterns causing ground temperature inversion can have a significant effect on the level of sound that resonates from the range. Recent heavy snowfall has shown that that too can amplify the level of sound. So you know, this, um, this open letter actually showed that the Army was um, you know, conscious of its uh, effects on the environment and on the people. All sounds really, really good. Um, and here again, it says, uh, you know, it, it actually said that they were going to uh, cease the use of Claymore mines in, in their operations. And uh, in summary here, he's saying, I'm sure you will welcome this news. It shows that we are committed to being responsible, considerate neighbours. And it says, we know that we are living in an ever-changing environment, and we hope that this goes some way to show the people of West Melton and Canterbury that we value their support and the continued use of the range as an essential training tool. So to me, that's sort of a basis, if you like, that of a noise management plan. He's you know, so ascribing to the fact that they know things about their environment. They, they want to work with the neighbours. It mentions meeting with concerned re residents. So that, that, that was good. But I guess since that time, there's been very little such communication from the army, right? Um, but to me, that actually, that's a written communication that, that actually reflects their position uh, in lieu of RSOs. And so in supporting Alistair with his proposal for setting up a, no a noise management plan, um, I, I came up with a, a list, I, I guess, that should be, um, which I thought should be included in, in a noise management plan, and, and that included community engagement plan, um, and in fact, readopting the style that was evident back in 2011, you know, meeting with residents and so on, actually, um, you know, a, a lot better than seems to be happening recently. So com community engagement plan, Complaints handling procedure uh, because they're you know, necessary with the sort of regime that we've got. Uh, a system for monitoring and reporting on noise levels. And NZDF need, need to support their advice that noise levels are not going to be increased, as, as they say. So this can only be confirmed by objective measurement and reporting. And really, it should start sooner rather than later. The other thing that I think needs to be included in a, in a, in a noise management plan is um, some idea about a, a concept for improvement. You know, that actually, the, the way that it's working at the moment, uh, there's a concept called the hierarchy of controls, right? That actually is a, a methodology for looking at how you, how you control hazards. And at the moment, we're controlling hazards at the bottom of the hazard control hierarchy. Uh, when we should be looking further up um, at things like engineering controls, these should be looked at as possibilities to improve uh, performance in the future. And and the other thing is that the NZD, if they should build on their experience, like um, the open letter says, how they know about the effect of, effect of inversions and so on on noise generated in, in the neighbourhood, and you know build build on that sort of thing. Um, rather than uh, a tendency to um, say nothing. So, yeah, thanks very much. I think that's um, my, my position there in support of what Alistair was presenting. Thank you very much. See if we have questions. Lindsay, any questions? Um, thank you for all the work that you've done in terms of preparing your, um, your submissions to us today. There is an overlap, if you like, with the noise hearing, which yep. you heard us talk about before, um, and we, where the, um, if you like, the DB lines are set and so forth, which we can't consider as part of this hearing. But I'm interested in your um, your views on the, on the noise management plan and what that should contain. Have you had the opportunity to have a look at uh, Ms Baverstock's evidence for New Zealand Defence Force, which has a uh, if you like, a scope of a noise management plan, a revised scope of a noise management plan. But what what I what I have seen has been the the, the rather vague one in the in the report that I think was um, from the council planner. Yeah, that that to me was uh, 
I think as, as mentioned by the previous speakers, really quite generic. And to me, what, 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 I, what I think um, I've observed is that when um, there's been very little communication uh, from, from the army about, about uh, much at all, um, then what, what I'm thinking is that a noise management plan needs to be quite prescriptive. Mm. So elements about you know how, how things are going to be communicated, um, frequency of reporting and so on needs to be quite uh, clearly identified. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that the, the intimation that I saw was that reporting should be like on a six monthly basis. And to me, that's too infrequent because by the time six months comes around, you're in the opposite season and who remembers you know, what was happening six months ago. Mm. And in fact, my, my experience, I used to work for Holton Cement and the cement kilns at Westport, they were had to be reported on like every three months and a formal report from the works to the council, which the public could actually view on the website if they wanted to. It's that sort of thing that I think um, you know, needs to be uh, included. So that it's actually, you know, it seems to me there's very little enthusiasm generated for doing much at all. You know, it's sort of, let's drag people along. It seems very, very little enthusiasm that, you know, when, when the neighbors actually do have quite a, a fragile position, if you like, with noise that could be generated, that there needs to be some confidence that the army actually has a, a genuine interest in keeping people involved in, 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 the, in the process of mm -hmm. managing the noise. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd say you know, at least a three monthly frequency is something that you know should be considered, I think. Yeah, I, I think, um... Ms. Baverstock and her evidence has taken the draft of Ms. Carruthers' suggestion for a noise management plan right. for what it can contain and nuance that, if you like, in terms of the, the position of the NZDF. I think the position of the NZDF and their evidence is they would prefer not to have a noise management plan, but if they had to have one, this is what it should contain. And I think the key distinction between uh, perhaps what you want and what the army wants is the um, is the prescription in terms of the, the metrics, if you like, in terms of the overall no noise profile, um, which you know, the army is reluctant to put up. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with um, with Al Alistair's point of view before that, you know, perhaps um, there needs to be some community involvement with setting the parameters for a noise management plan that uh, unless there's some involvement, some the other, the other thing that's been um, apparent is a certain lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. You know, that when, when we looked at, uh, for example, the, the, the letter uh, in 2011, you know, that Phil McKee was saying in there, they know these things. They know that, they ha that, that, they, that there's an effect of, um, on the noise propagation by inversion. And mysteriously, uh, when you know, that proposition was put as a submission, it was actually rejected by the army. So how can you actually like know something that this is occurring, and then actually say, well, we actually reject that in terms of of, of a submission, and you've actually said that you know this. Okay. Uh, I'm actually, you know, and that's sort of to me is a lack of transparency. If you know something, then please like build on it and and actually. You know, if you know it, it's actually justified true to true belief, mm. and it needs to be then not not say, well, we don't know it anymore. I mean, I really felt uh, quite um, taken aback at that that sort of position. Okay. So, 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 really, really, the, the concept of a noise management plan you support, it's perhaps the degree of of specificity which yes, is yes, the and, they, and I think now this, is this, feeling, you. this feeling of like um, a lack of transparency mm. that um, um, when Alistair spoke to the fact that you know I'd like to see community involvement in this I, I felt that was probably a good idea because of the history of lack of transparency that if you can't actually fully trust you know that, that you're only going to get a good result 
that is actually adequate to protect the natives, then, you know, it's actually, that's why, you know, the need for prescription, transparency and, and involvement, I think, um, would be a good idea. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, what, what I like to see in New Zealand is, is, is advancement of knowledge and transparency. And, you know, to me, the film, the key thing about, you know, we now know this about uh, the effects of temperature inversion on noise propagation. We've got a great university at Canterbury. We've got the uh, Department of Geogra Geography there that's actually done heaps of modelling of the air pollution in the Canterbury watersheds. A great opportunity for the army to come along. Hey, we've got a noise problem. Um, we can do some modelling of what might happen with inversions at West Melton. That's, that's, that's the sort of thing I like to see. I like to see us build on what we know, um, increasing explanatory power and not, not actually say, well, we knew it in 2011, but we don't know it today. It's, uh, yeah, I don't like that sort of approach. Okay, thank you. Yvette, any questions or clarification? Kia thank you for, um, for the, all the money that you've done to put this mission together. Um, I know I had no further questions. Kia ora, thank you. Thank you, and Deborah, any questions? And Mr. Halliday, no further questions from me either, but as you'll probably recall, we did explore some of these issues extensively <laughs> yeah. in the noise here. So I tend to get a bit heat up when. Yeah, absolutely so. fine. Uh, so just for the benefit of the um, panel members who weren't on the noise hearing a live issue for that panel is what, if any, provisions and controls should be placed on noise sensitive activities within the 65 dBA and 55 dBA noise contours surrounding this West Melton rifle range. So that's a live issue in front of the noise committee on the noise panel that we'll be putting our minds to. So the, the matters are related. So our next submitter is the New Zealand Defence Force, but what we'll do is take a five minute break while we get everything set up and then we'll reconvene in about five minutes time. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah,
So, Mr. Owen, thanks, Mr. <laughs> See you there, Mr. Humperson. Who else are we waiting for? And legal counsel. So, two um, <clears throat> NZDF representatives. Is legal counsel going to appear as well? Yes, yes, they are. Um, I am just chasing them via um, all other means of communication to get them online. I see Mr. McNamara has joined us. Uh, yes, I'm hoping you can hear me, sir. Yep, excellent. All right, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. It's still morning by two minutes, and welcome to the NZDF uh, representatives. So I think a number of you have appeared um, before us before. Probably, Mr. Owen, you're the only one who hasn't uh, at this stage. Um, so the outline or the procedure is thanks very much for providing the written material, including the original submissions, legal submissions, and the evidence. We've read all of that material, so you don't need to reread any of that out loud to us, but of course you are very welcome to highlight key points for us and we'll see if we have questions. And probably Mr. McNamara, probably um, best, I think, if we start with you and to introduce uh, your team and to lead the case for the Defence Force. Thank you. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Just checking that you can hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. We can hear and see you. That's great. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, good morning, just still, um, and thank you for your time. Um, I'm here obviously representing the New Zealand Defence Force with uh, Mr Owen, uh, Ms Baverstock and uh, Mr Humpherson, um, whose evidence I'll touch on um, briefly during my presentation. Um, I will just, if I may, um, speak to the legal submission and make a number of minor um, corrections before taking questions and then um, turning to the witnesses. So uh, picking up, at um, page um, one of the submission, paragraph 1.4, I think the key issue for this hearing is first whether a noise management plan is necessary and appropriate uh, and required as a condition of the designation. And secondly, if so, uh, what a noise management plan should provide for. The section 171 report uh, prepared by Ms Carruthers recommends, and I'm at 1.4 here, if I could make my first uh, minor amendment to the written submission, if we could just delete the words that uh, conditions to the WMMR designation, because of course there are currently no conditions on the designation, uh, and, and the issue really is whether a condition be added to provide for an, an, a noise management plan. So if we just delete the words conditions for the in um, the second line of 1.4, and then it would read designation is modified to include a condition. The purpose of the NMP would primarily be to address the process for community engagement and for complaints about noise from the range. The NZDF position, as the panel is now aware, is that an NMP is unnecessary, given that it's already implemented the BPO in respect of noise emissions from the range and complying with its Section 16 duty. However, in the event that the panel is of a different view, we have filed expert evidence that sets out amendments to the proposed conditions. I don't, I think, need to go into the range. Uh, you'll know uh, what it is and the activities that occur there from, from the evidence. Uh, the three witnesses uh, who are here today, Mr. Rob Owen, the NZDF's Director of Environmental Services, who will discuss management of noise at the range and NZDF's position. 
Mr Humpherson from TNT, who you'll be familiar with, uh, those of you who were presiding over the noise hearing, he prepared the noise contours that have been of assistance in that uh, chapter, and uh, Ms Baverstock, whose uh, recommendations you've already mentioned in discussions with submitters this morning. You also have the letter uh, that was filed by Ms Davies. Um, it's fair to say that was somewhat of a holding position, um, given uh, we sought an extension of time. Um, she's not called today, but that um, uh, is, is also part of the NZDF case. I briefly touch on the statutory framework. Uh, we broadly agree with the legal opinion um, which was obtained. Um, the primary question addressed in that opinion was uh, now that submissions have been received on the designation that NZDF has sought to roll over, is it possible to condition that designation? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, I've uh, referred to the relevant provisions, Clause 4, Clause 9, and Schedule 1, Section 171 then comes into play, uh, which was what the legal opinion covered. Um, then the council has a power to confirm the requirement, modify it, condition it, or recommend withdrawal. And then um, finally at 4.1, I refer to section 172. Um, the second of my amendments, um, I should also add and clause 13.1 of schedule one. Um, I think it's fair to say, um, those of you who've sat in on designation hearings, um, whilst the case law is clear that Schedule 1 and um, Part 8, the provisions about designations operate in tandem. Um, the, the drafting is poor um, and um, it, it is something that we would hope uh, in the next version <laughs> of this legislation would be approved. But I think it's pretty clear, uh, obviously, the requiring authority receives the recommendation and is the decision maker. Uh, what the legal opinion uh, commissioned by the council didn't cover was the issue of scope. Um, I think it's equally clear uh, that the scope to recommend conditions or modify the requirement isn't unlimited. Um, I refer to case law um, about the environment court's powers to modify um, a notice of requirement and uh, condition uh, the notice of requirement. And that's clear that there are two essential constraints. First, modification is constrained by principles of fairness, which is the normal sort of approach um, to scope, which was what was really on the table or what would a submitter or the requiring authority think uh, could be an outcome of the process. And secondly, we have the Newbury principles, which, again, commissioners will be familiar with in the resource consent context, but it's also been established that they are equal, equally applicable to conditions imposed on a designation. And for present purposes, um, the most relevant of those is the requirement that a condition be reasonable. So the submission at 4.5 is that these principles um, equally constrain the council's power to make recommendations, modifying or opposing conditions, which is set out in broadly similar terms to the environment court's power under section 174. Uh, turning to the um, section 171 report, uh, it recommends um, that a noise management plan is included as a condition to the designation. If I could just briefly turn to the relevant parts of that report, because respectfully, um, NZDF agrees with most of it. Um, until we um, get to the, the, the point in uh, uh, Appendix 2 where the, where the contents of an MMP is set out. So if we, if we look at the, the analysis, um, starting at 9.13, uh, the author states, I consider it would be inappropriate to compromise the operation and security of the range by imposing conditions to restrict activities on the range 
in order to invest, address reverse sensitivity effects that have arisen. Then at 9.14, um, there's the comment about, uh, given the significant variability in noise generated from the range and NZDF confidentiality concerns, it's likely that any NMP would be high level and generic. And this was a, a passage referred to by one of the submitters this morning. And the, the confidentiality point there is really uh, reference to um, particular types of weaponry used. But I think equally, we, we had a, uh, an admission that that wasn't the primary focus of submitter concerns. It was more with the noise generated. At 9.15, um, the key to an NMP and the conditions is striking an appropriate balance between not unduly restricting NZDF's operations and improving noise management. It is recommended that such a condition not restrict what NZDF can and cannot do on the range and set limits on that, but rather primarily address the process for complaints and engagement with the community. Uh, and then again at 9.17, the condition should not be designed to restrict what NZDF can and cannot do on the range. Uh, now, as Ms. Baverstock will cover in her evidence, um, once we get to the recommended conditions themselves in Appendix 2, uh, we start to get a bit of a disconnect with those high-level statements I've just taken you to, um, insofar as the conditions refer as one of the, as one of the purposes of the NMP to providing uh, assurance that the level of activity at the range fits within modelled contours and that the contours continue to be appropriate. Now, uh, Ms. Baverstock and Mr. Humpherson will address you on that point. Picking up at 5.3, the current designation is not subject to conditions. However, the NZDF is obliged to, and I've used the word endure, that's a typo, it should be ensure. <laughs> It made it through spell check, uh, ensure that noise emissions from the range are reasonable. The mitigations in place are, are described in the evidence of uh, major challenges from the hear, uh, noise hearing topic 17 and relied on in evidence to this hearing. So limits on nighttime firing, um, uh, and, and an absolute prohibition on, on grenade training and demolition charges at night time. Um, the uh, notice requirements that have been touched on this morning um, through newspaper advertisements and the community Facebook page, um, restricting firing when inversion conditions are present. So um, to the previous speaker, it's it's more than just learning, I guess, um, about how noise behaves in inversion. It's that activities cease when inversion is noticed. Uh, the orientation of firing away from the residential areas, the construction of the noise buns and the min minimising amount of charge used. And the combination of those measures uh, leads Mr Humpherson to conclude that the BPO is being adopted at present and Ms Baverstock's of the same opinion. And the success of these measures is reflected in the relatively small number of uh, complaints. And I refer to um, the statement of evidence of Rebecca Davies there in footnote 28. Um, the number of complaints is 36 over a nine and a half year period. Um, over half of those, uh, sorry, almost half of those, so 15 of that 36 being from just two submitters. Uh, why an NMP is unnecessary? Um, the panel will be familiar with section 16 and the definition of BPO um, earlier in the Act. As I noted, the expert evidence of, Dr. of Mr. Humpherson is that the BPO is being adopted, and Mr. Owen's evidence is that an NMP is unnecessary, and he, he will speak to that. Um, uh, Mr. Owen's evidence is that limitations on noise emissions beyond those in section 16 could impede NZDF's ability to fulfill its statutory purpose under the, NZ, under the Defence Act. Uh, the minister who controls the NZDF needs to maintain flexibility to train um, troops and uh, achieve directed levels of operational capability. And we see daily how uh, the global situation places changing demands on NZDF capability. As Mr Owen explains, that may require activities at the range 
to increase in intensity and frequency from time to time. It does not mean NZDFC is carte blanche. It's committed to being a good neighbour and will continue to inform neighbours of activities it's planning to undertake through long established and demonstrably successful measures. Uh, I refer to the uh, Transrail case there, which was the um, case of the hillside workshops in Dunedin, which are quite well known to, to many of us. Um, there, the only condition placed on uh, a designation that to that point had been unconditioned was no wider than uh, to reflect the Section 16 obligation to which Transrail was already subject like anybody else. Uh, I refer to relevant RPS and district plan provisions in the following paragraphs. Um, obviously, the officer's report identifies uh, the range as being uh, strategic infrastructure uh, and um, within the definition of regionally significant infrastructure. And clearly, then, there are relevant uh, policies, um, both at the regional level and in the district plan, which are matters that this panel must have particular regard to in terms of the Section 171 decision-making framework. So uh, at 5.19, it's the NZDF submissions that constraints on the emission of noise beyond the duty imposed by Section 16 would be contrary to the objectives and policies in the Canterbury RPS, the proposed RPS, that seek to ensure the efficient operation, use and development of strategic infrastructure such as the range. Now, notwithstanding that our primary position is that an NMP is not necessary given the BPO that's already being adopted, Ms. Babistock's evidence does set out amended conditions in the event commissioners decide that an NMP is necessary and appropriate. Uh, she, uh, uh, her amendments reflect Mr. Humpherson's evidence as to the technical feasibility of proposed conditions. Now, I deal with that point uh, at 5.22 and 5.23. Uh, if you've had the chance to read your evidence, you'll see that he explains um, how and why the LDN um, uh, contours were prepared essentially uh, for land use planning purposes uh, rather uh, than for the purposes of being a compliance uh, limit that um, could be used in the type of way that has been mentioned by submitters earlier this morning. Uh, in I'm at the top of um, page 11 of the written submission now. Um, a light to that point is that um, verification of those contours through modelling and that NDDF activities fell within those contours would also be extremely onerous. Accordingly, the NDDF submission is that would be, it would be unreasonable and contrary to Newbury principles um, to include the proposed condition 1A um, for the WMMR in the Council's recommendation to the Minister of Defence. Um, and I probably don't need to um, say, I can just speak to 5.25. Uh, Mr. Humpherson's um, evidence is that that condition would go beyond the primary purpose of an NMP, um, which per the officer's report would be to address the process for complaints and engagement with the community. Um, the interrelationship of an NMP with the relief sought by NZDF in hearing 17, um, that's covered by Ms. Babistock in paragraph 20 of her evidence. Uh, in summary, that a recommendation that an NMP should be a condition of the WMR designation is only appropriate if the relief sought by NZDF at hearing 17, um, that land use control is protecting the range from reverse sensitivity, of sensitivity effects be granted. Um, so uh, I also, lastly, at 5.28, just make a timing point, which is that um, NZDF is a decision maker here, and so it assists in that decision making for uh, both the decisions on Chapter 17 and the recommendations in respect of this designation to be released simultaneously.
So um, that's all I wish to say in speaking to the submissions, but obviously I'll take questions before introducing my witnesses. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. McNamara. That was a very fulsome summary of the legal submissions that we had already read. Um, just before I ask you a question, there's a Chris Ryan appearing on our screen. Who is Mr. Ryan? Is he part oh, of your I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Ryan's um, assisted me with this it's, it's <laughs> on this matter. So. Oh, okay. Thanks. It just gives us, um, lets us know who he is. All right, just in terms of that issue you raised at um, 5.28, my understanding is that the uh, recommendations that we make to the council regarding the recommendations they will make to the various requiring authorities will be released simultaneously with decisions on the rest of the plan. So I'm pretty sure that will be the case for the reasons that you point out. Thank you, sir. Okay. We'll just see if we have any uh, questions for you. Lindsay, any questions from the legal submissions? Nothing from legal submissions, thank you. And have you had any questions? No, thank you. And Deborah. No, thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. McNamara. It appears we understood in the issues that you were raising, so we don't have any questions for you. Possibly more false than necessary, sir, but I have no questions, so something's been achieved. Um, so with that, sir, I'll, I'll call Mr. Owen um, from the NZDF, um, followed by Mr. Humpherson and Ms. Bannerstock. Great, thanks very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Owen. Um, we've read the evidence that you have submitted, so you don't need to reread that to us, but um, very welcome to highlight any key points you wish to bring to our attention. And I think you're still muted, so if you just turn your microphone on. Or is... Right, so the host has now graciously invited me to unmute. Here we go. I should introduce myself, I think. Um, so obviously I'm Rob Owen, I'm employed in uh, NGGF as a Director of Environmental Services. I've held that position since 2006 and prior to that um, I held similar positions just in Army. The role currently is Tri-Service, so Army, Navy, Air Force. I have about 20 people work for me uh, covering all the interactions that uh, NZDF has with uh, the environment and a lot of that obviously is, uh, is RMA. Um, when I started in uh, 2001 or two, I can't actually remember now, so long ago, um, West Melton um, Range was on the, um, on the radar and has been ever since. So there's a little bit of background that I have. Um, I actually just flicked through some uh, documents on my screen while we were watching the previous submitter that pointed out to you, uh, I made a claim that the 55 dB contour line had changed in that time. Well, I've looked at reports from 2002 right through, and um, those lines, the contour lines, have been more or less where they uh, where they always are. So that's a bit of an amendment to my introduction. Now moving on. Um, so I'm relying on the evidence presented by others, obviously, because I'm not technically expert in uh, in any of this. But following the um, following the uh, letter that um, Rebecca Davies submitted, we had some internal discussions and. We're now, uh, I guess, NTGF is now in a better position to express a, a reasonably clear view. And and that really is that um, we are aware, fully aware of Section 16, our obligations under that. That is what we have always worked to. And um, that is that you know, noise emitted from the range should not exceed, not, not be unreasonable, I think is the, exact, is the exact phrasing. And that is what we have always worked to achieve, uh, in my view. So it's, um, since those um, the, the range was reconfigured in um, in uh, the late 90s, now I've said in my evidence that um, I'll just rely entirely on uh, prior reading of uh, Major Charlie's evidence. But seeing that uh, some of the uh, members of the panel were not attended at the at the uh, noise hearing, I would just like to refer to some specific points, if I may. So. At paragraphs 9 to 16, Major Charlie tells us about the range, how important it is to NZDF. It's the only long-distance range in the South Island. It's used by units from ourselves and from the police. It's used for other training activities. But mainly, it's, it's, main, it's main reason to be is live firing and, and explosives training. Um, noise generations will include blank firing and helicopter activity. And I think most importantly uh, in this context, that it's been in use since the 1940s. It's not a new thing. You know, we're not talking about a new activity that the minister is proposing. The only new thing here 
there's increasing numbers of uh, residents nearby. That's that's new. And um, then Major Tallis moves on to paragraph 15 and 16, tells us how the activities on the range are managed through a central booking system. And that I think quite importantly, uh, over the last couple of years, that uh, the effect of COVID and the commitment of NZDF to op what we call Offer Protect, running MIQ, uh, means that uh, activity levels and therefore noise levels at the range have dropped, have been low for the last couple of years. Now, the whole of the rest of Mr. Chelly's evidence, Major Chelly's evidence, sorry, um, is concerned about the management practices currently in place to manage noise generation at the range. Now, this is what uh, Mr. McNamara has referred to as BPO and Mr. De Mr. Humphison will refer to as BPO. This is what we do to um, address our um, obligations under, under Section 16. So at, par at paragraph 20, Mr. Ch Major Chalice tells us that all the activities are managed through range standing orders. Now, standing orders don't just cover noise management. They cover everything at the range, including aspects of, of safety and security. Um, and that is probably why uh, one of the reasons why range standing orders cannot be published. Um, we don't publish that sort of information um, no, for obvious re well, reasons which I think are obvious. But it does, at Para 21, Mr. Major Tallis talks about the details on noise management, minimisation, engagement with the community. And I, again, I think quite significantly for you, his, his advice is that the current uh, RSOs, as they relate to noise management, have evolved through discussions with the community. And that is my experience from, from Wellington over a period of 20 years. West Melton has been an activity or a, a, a thing bubbling away in the background. And and various um, uh, camp, camp commanders and, and, and the uh, major tally's predecessor have, have just engaged with the community in different ways. And, and what we, we feel that what we've got here is not a, it's not a bad representation of, of what the community's um, wishes were. Um, it's, if it, you know, nothing is perfect. Nothing is perfect. There's always scope for um, improvement, but it's key that the, the, the noise management things that are matters that are in the RSOs have evolved from discussions, have involved um, discussion with the community. One of your previous submitters referred to um, the events of uh, 2009, I think it was, and the letter that, that Phil McKee, Colonel Phil McKee wrote. Uh, and, and that's written in there. That's that's the whole basis for the, um, the fact that if there is a temperature inversion in, in place, we limit or stop what we're doing at West Melton. So, so we, you know, we are responsive to the community and we are amending the BPO as we go along. Okay, well, I think we're returning to my evidence now. Uh, <clears throat> so where was I? <laughs> Paragraph eight, I think. So as a result of all that, uh, all that work and all that uh, following the BPO, we don't, we don't get many complaints and uh, others have told you about the numbers there. Um, now, the Minister of Defence has to maintain ability to train troops for anything and everything, and that includes you know, live firing and use of explosives. Um, and sometimes that will mean that we need to do things that are different, that are outside the norm. Uh, if a, um, I think Mr. McNamara covered this, if a um, demand suddenly arises for troops to undertake a particular operation in a particular place, they need to train for that. So we cannot, the minister cannot, accept um, the idea that he will be constrained in what he can do at the range. And because most of what he does at the range makes noise, I think it follows that the minister cannot accept that the amount of noise he, he needs to make or he needs his people to make can be constrained. So, we're done. This concern in the army that a noise management plan, as has been discussed and called for, um, would require us to publish information about nature of activities and the purpose of activities. And that, again, is something that we cannot do for security reasons. We will not do for security reasons. If we're, if we're planning an operation, we don't tell the world that we're planning an operation, a specific operation. 
we're training a new weapon, we don't tell the world that we're training with a new weapon. And if we're just bringing a truckload of grenades down from our ammunition area to, to use at West Melton, we don't tell the world about that either. So the minister will not be able to accept um, recommendations for a, um, a noise management plan that, that requires publications of those details. Nor for the purpose of activities. Uh, for instance, the, the RSOs at the moment require a unit planning and act, uh, noisy activities to consider whether that activity is best carried out at West Melton or somewhere else. Now, if if that requirement from range standing orders was to be written into a noise management plan so that we had to publish why we're doing an activity or publish our considerations, that breaches security and, and the minister will not be able to do that. His obligations are lie elsewhere to, to national security, if you like. So I think overall what I'm saying is that we've we've implemented Best practical option for noise management over a long period at the range. We generate a very small number of complaints from a very small number of people. Um, and we think that we are meeting our Section 16 obligations. That therefore, uh, a noise management plan is unnecessary. Um, I think that's enough from me. Obviously, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ahn. Um Given you're the NZDF representative in front of us this morning, I'll just have two questions for you uh, before I hand over to the uh, rest of the panel. The first question is that if we were to, via the council, recommend to the minister that a condition be imposed regarding a noise management plan and we were to find in favour of the wording in Ms Baverstock's evidence before us, as opposed to the wording uh, in the Section 42A report, would your recommendation be to the Minister to accept that condition that Ms Baverstock has formulated? My recommendation to the Minister would be to accept that recommendation. The Minister will receive um, advice from multiple sources. That's very helpful. Uh, thank you for that. And secondly, in terms of the wording that Ms. Baverstock has helpfully um, prepared for us, uh, it involves a process whereby um, NZDF uh, prepares a noise management plan and provides it to the council. The council can then uh, suggest amendments and then NZDF uh, lets the council know whether or not agrees with those amendments with, with reasons. This morning we've heard from submitters that um, they would like to see some opportunity for residents to have input to that process. What's your view on enabling that to occur by way of some kind of uh, representative group? I'm aware that other noise management plan conditions on designations um, provide for the requiring authority to consult with some uh, representative group of residents and to take on board their concerns so they don't have a, a right of veto or anything, but it's more of a a codified consultation process before the noise management plan is then provided to the council. Do you have a view on whether or not that would be appropriate in this case? I have a view um, and I'll give it to you, but first I have to say that's not necessarily the minister's view. The minister will receive advice from different directions. In my view, uh, noise management plan is about uh, openness and transparency. It is about giving the, the affected community um, the uh, justified belief that they have influenced what goes on, that they have shaped the thing, um, that they are part of it, uh, part of the solution, not part of the problem. So I would see that we would pursue um, a, uh, a process of preparing that management plan and that would involve the community in um, whatever most effective way we can find. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that um, the statutory time periods might make that difficult um, in that you know, you've told us that the, uh, the decisions about the uh, this recommendation would be released at the same time as the rest of the plan and the, there is then a fairly short uh, time frame in which we can uh, do that work. Uh, that might be difficult. 
but um, I assume that with the best will in the world, when we get there, um, we'll work our way through that. All right, thank you very much. That's, that's also a helpful answer. And so, Ms. Beverstock, when we come to hear from you, I might suggest to you that you might consider some rewording of your recommended condition or subclause three of the condition that you've recommended that might codify some form of community consultation that Mr. Owen has just told us the NZDF would wish to pursue in any case. I'll just see if we have any further questions for you, Mr. Owen. Uh, Lindsay, any further questions? Um, only one. Um, NZDF obviously have, has a lot of facilities up and down the country doing various different things, uh, right from quite you know potentially noisy activities such as you know, I'm thinking of a Haki rear base for example as being being one which has has a noise profile. Many of these other facilities actually operate under a noise management plan. No. Is, so this would be the national exception that there, if there was to be a noise management plan imposed or recommended, sorry. Yes, there is a perhaps a um, slight comparison in the, in the case of, for instance, Fenorpai Airfield, where there are air noise contours, similar to uh, Christchurch Airport, um, where the, there are you know, air noise contours with, which we are supposed not to exceed. Um, and if we ever uh, felt that the number of the flying activity was, was getting as close to those contours, we would need to check and make sure that was not the, not the case. But, but no, there is nowhere else where there's an always management plan. Okay. Thank you. I think more. Thank you. Have you any questions? Sure, thank you. No. And Deborah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Owen. That seems to be the end of our questions for you, but thanks very much for coming for us this morning. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Humpherson now, sir. Good afternoon, panel. Um, I'm going to just talk briefly in terms of my evidence and just explain why we've come to the conclusion that condition 1A is inappropriate uh, and it effectively it would be technically unreasonable, incorrect to use the model contours for the purposes of assessing compliance or verification. And that's outlined in my evidence at paragraphs 10 to 16. And uh, with your approval, sir, I'll just run through key points um, associated with my evidence. Um, first of all, the computer modeling that was undertaken is a theoretical exercise. The input data is based on the source levels of the individual weapon types and explosives. Um, those were taken close to the source of the noise, not in the community. And the modeling includes the location, the number of times that weapon is used over an annual period. So the contours represent an annual average of the noise, not the noise on any particular one day. Noise generated by the range is impulsive in nature. Uh, it varies according to the types of training that is taking place, as Mr. Owen explained, and also the time of day and the number of times it takes place over the year. So that noise does vary immensely and there can be periods of intense activity to periods of very little activity. So the noise varies enormously over the period of a year uh, and obviously on a day-to-day -day basis. If the contours were used for the, in, within the scope of a noise management plan for assessing compliance, it would be extremely onerous, as Mr. McNamara has explained, and difficult to undertake sufficient noise monitoring to demonstrate compliance and therefore the extent of the noise contours. As the noise contours are an average of one year of activity, to properly verify them, noise monitoring would need to be undertaken over a similar period of time. That would be extremely onerous, it would be extremely difficult and it would be extremely uh, expensive to undertake. So in conclusion, the ranges modeled noise contours be prepared for the sole purposes of assessing and imposing requirements for land use planning controls and not for compliance purposes. And happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that. Uh, questions, Lindsay? Um, thank you, Mr. Humpherson. Just, just one, you, you deal with, um, as an acoustic consultant, you deal with noise and management plans and all sorts of different scenarios. Um, is it fair to say that in this particular case, the noise management plan being 
proposed by Ms. Baverstock is more codifying the BPO as opposed to actually putting limits for compliance purposes. That is correct. From my experience, there can be two types of management plan, as you've explained. Um, the best approach is always to, in terms of being open and transparent with the community. And that's where the engagement and the notification comes in place. And that's a better outcome than trying to assess compliance, especially in terms of the way these contours have been generated. Okay, thank you. Is there any questions? Sure, no, thank you. And Deborah, any questions? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I have one, and it's in regards to, sorry, it's in regards to Mr. Halliday. Um, he actually mentioned um, about the Schultz curve with regards to understanding the nuisance effects. Um, and I just wonder, have you got any further comment on the use of a Schultz curve? So the Schultz curve is an annoyance response. So it's got the degree of annoyance on the x-axis and the decibel level. Uh, and in the original report that informed the hearing 17 contours, which is the technical report that I authored from Tonkin and Taylor, ex ex explained the process that was undertaken to come up with a sensible noise level, this 55 and 65. And that is based in part on the Schultz curve, but it's also in part based on the guidance that comes out from the US uh, Defence and also the UK Ministry of Defence as well. So it is a, an adaption of that contour that has taken place. And the whole basis of the contours that were derived have been peer reviewed by Selwyn District Councils at NICE Expert. And at, as we discussed at hearing 17, there was a general agreement between myself and the council's expert that the appropriate approach had been adopted. Yeah, Mr. Humpson, no further questions from me, but thank you for um, setting out very clearly in your evidence and easy to understand terms why, in your view, it's technically incorrect to use model contours for the purposes of compliance. So, but no further questions, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Finally, uh, I call Ms. Baverstock. Um, good afternoon to the hearings panel. Um, I will start at paragraph nine of my evidence. Uh, as Mr. McNamara has already pointed out, the key planning issue for this hearing is the appropriateness and resource management terms of an NMP. And if an NMP is appropriate, what it should contain. In my opinion, new condition requiring an NMP is not required to manage noise effects of the rifle range. As canvassed through evidence in hearing 17, noise, NZF is bound by the duty under section 16 of the RMA and adopts a BPO approach to avoid unreasonable noise. The limited number of complaints received in relation to activities at the range indicates these measures currently adopted by NZDF are largely successful in terms of managing effects. However, should the commissioners consider that noise effects from the operation of the range does require land use controls in the proposed district plan to protect the range from reverse sensitivity effects, then in my opinion, for transparency purposes and consistent with current practice, it is reasonable to have the requirement for an NMP for a former condition of the, the designation. And I do note, note too that um, the matter of transparency was raised earlier by Mr. Halliday and, and is also implicit in the evidence of both um, Mr. Nicol and Mr. Um, Hyler that you heard earlier. So in attachment one to my evidence, I've suggested an, an amended NMP condition in noting, um, as, as Mr. Owen has pointed out, the inclusion of such condition and specific wording is, is obviously subject to the minister's decision. As set out at paragraph 19 of my evidence, my amendments take into account the technical matters outlined in Mr. Humpherson's evidence, which you've just heard. The analysis set out in paragraphs 9.15 to 9.17 of the section 171 report regarding an NMP primarily addressing the process of complaints and engagement with the community. And that's also supported by Mr. Humperdin's evidence in hearing 17 regarding the importance of noise management and mitigation, including community engagement, complaints procedures, and notice regarding noisy events in terms of how people perceive and respond to noise generated by the range. And then finally, the direction set by the Canter Canterbury Regional Policy Statement. And I know that's also acknowledged in the um, Section 171 report. 
With paragraph 920 of the section 171 report, Ms Carruthers recommends that the designation be amended to include an NMP condition striking an appropriate balance between not unduly restricting NZDF's operations and improving noise management. And in my opinion, the proposed condition as amended achieves this, this balance. So I'll now turn to attachment one to talk through my proposed amendments. So I've suggested deleting 1A, which is the primary objective, um, one of the primary objectives of an NMP. And that's on the basis that firstly, while an NMP might serve the purpose of providing the community with assurance, I do not consider reference out to a third party or third parties in this instance should be reflected in the objectives in the NMP. And I also note that for some members of the community, this could be simply unachievable. In terms of the second part of the objective, I refer to Mr. Humpherson's evidence um, regarding the purpose and the limitations of the noise contours. I've suggested the addition of A and B, um, so identifying management and mitigation measures and setting out roles and responsibilities, and they're very standard requirements for um, an NMP. And then in C, um, I've retained address the process, retain, sorry, redress the, address the process for complaints and engagement with the community. Um, and I do note there, just picking up the on the point earlier regarding community input, that is um, provided for in that, but I do think that that condition could be expanded out to possibly specifically reference community input into the development and implement, implementation of an NMP. In condition three, I've made a few tweaks to provide um, a bit more of a realistic time to prepare that NMP. Um, picking up on what Mr. Owen has said, um, that three month period might still be tight if there's um, if we then incorporate provision for community engagement and input into the NMP. So just noting that. Um, while certification is very standard for um, this type of condition, NZDF has indicated that um, the long-standing nature of the designation and limited noise effects means it doesn't support the certification process. So I have suggested some an alternative that, that responds to that. And then condition for the amendments there, just follow on from that, um, the amendments to condition three. And then in 4A, I've expanded that out or, or recommended expanding that out to pick up on mitigation and management. And then that's also where the measurement and monitoring of noise sources um, is encapsulated as opposed to that overall objective that it, um, it meets those noise contour limits. And then I've retained the um, conditions as otherwise proposed in the section 171 report. Um, I do note too that there is also the potential to um, include provision for community um, engagement into that NMP in a similar way to the way condition three is worded. So um, requiring that the, um, the requiring report authority prepare the draft NMP, uh, provide for community liaison representative for review and input prior to finalising um, with a similar feedback loop um, as condition three. I, I am a little bit wary of um, preparing, preparing conditions on the fly, so um, if it was of use to the um, hearings commissioners, I'd be happy to update this and, and provide an updated attachment one um, within the next day or two. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Beverstock. So just in terms of that, didn't catch the last part of what you said. So in terms of um, updating your recommended conditions to uh, codify a community um, input process, whether it's condition three or condition four, what sort of time frame did you say? Um, I have, I've actually marked up some changes on the fly, but I could provide an updated attachment one um, by close of business tomorrow if that was useful to the commissioners. Oh, that's fine. I mean, it, it, as long as it's within the next week or so. Yeah, if that, that's very you, straightforward. Yeah, you want to consult with um, probably yes. Mr. Owen and others, so that's yes. fine. Yep. All right, so thanks very much for that um, and for outlining uh, your evidence. I'll just see if we have any questions for you. Lindsay, any questions? Um, 
really it's in relation to you know the benefits of using a BPO as opposed to having a noise management plan. Um, we've been told fairly consistently that the that NZDF uses the BPO, and I think I put this question to Mr. Humperson as well. But doesn't the NMP, NMP take it that much further in actually codifying that as a public document uh, within the limitations that the NZDF has? Um, and, and so just to give, give a little bit more confidence to, to those that might be interested in the subject, that there is a process in place. Hmm. Um, that's, that, I take, is your position? That, that, that absolutely is my position. It, it, it simply codifies what NZDF is doing already, provides that level of transparency and accountability, and provides for some community engagement specifically into that. Yes. And, and, and it's, it's one arm... Um, of uh, there's like two two prongs to it. You've got you you you've, you're seeking land use controls as part of the noise hearing, and mm -hmm. then there is the actual management of the activities on site itself. Yes. Yep. Of the okay. okay, thank you. That's very clear. <coughs> In a bit. No, thank you. And thank Deborah, you for your submission. Yes, thank you. Um, just one, and it's a point really of clarification of understanding. Um, we had in Mr. Halliday's evidence about um, the prescriptiveness of a noise management plan um, being quite prescriptive instead of um, quite vague and the difference between reporting six monthly versus three monthly. Have you got any comment to make on that, please? <laughs> Um, certainly. I, I, I noticed um, Mr. Hyler also referred to the, the high-level and generic um, noise management plan. I, I think the high-level generic refers to the actual activities and the security considerations that Mr. Owen referred to in his evidence. I think the actual noise management plan itself can be quite specific in terms of how the community is engaged with um, the how notices regarding noisy events are put out into the community, um, how feedback is received, how the complaints procedure works, etc. I, I actually think there can be a high degree of specificity within the noise management plan, um, provided that it's about how noise is managed and mitigated versus the actual activities that are occurring at the base. So I, I think there is a distinction there and an, an, an important one. So, And Mr. Everstock, no further uh, questions from me, but just to the NZDF team in total, just like to express uh, my appreciation for your input this morning. As you know, and as we know, the conditions that may be imposed on the de designation are ultimately at the discretion of the requiring authority. So I'm pleased to see the, uh, the approach you've taken, whereby Mr. Owen, you have this morning uh, confirmed that should we adopt Ms. Beverstock's recommended wording, you would be recommending that that uh, be accepted. Uh, that gives us confidence moving forward. And other than that, Ms. Beverstock, look forward to the further work you're gonna do in terms of the wording that you recommend to us. Thank you. That's all from us, Mr. McNamara. Thank you, Commissioner, for that. Um, nothing further from us. Excellent, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. And that brings us to the close of this part of the hearing. So back to the 42A team, obviously, um, you'll await Ms. Bapperstock's further work she's going to do, and then you'll prepare your reply report thereafter. <clears throat> How long do you think after you get uh, Ms. Bapperstock's uh, work? Obviously, there's the other issue raised by the Nesbitt submitters that you want to consider as well. Can you give us a rough indication of a time frame for your reply report? Shall we say end of next week at this point? Oh, look, I'm just, yeah, so look, say if you can say, look, within a week or two of getting Miss Beverstock's work, you yep. should be able to get something to us. That's just the kind of indication I was looking for. Yep, so I'm looking at what else is coming down the tracks at me. <laughs> yeah. Um, <coughs> the, um, the right of reply for this for this hearing should be fairly brief. So yep. if I can get that off, off my desk and back onto yours, that suits me beautifully. Excellent. Well, that's good. So we'll look forward to hearing from you um, probably within about two or three weeks' time at the most. Perfect. Right. Thanks very much, everyone. That concludes this part of the hearing.